Tilo, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like and comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see it, man. It's the warning screen, so take heed to it and pay attention. I'm here for educational purposes. I want to learn about stuff. Don't forget, man, if you do want to catch a live, just go to twitch.com, and here's the username on the bottom of the screen to you see it. Uh, don't forget, we got Patreon, and we got merch. Patreon is where we post content, which we can't post on YouTube. And uh, this is OCG TV. This is, this is why Britain's richest criminal was shot dead in his own garden. Tough. Talk to me. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. It was a summer afternoon on June 24th, 2015, when John Palmer was burning documents in a secluded part of his garden. Unbeknown to him, he was being watched burning. by his own killer through a hole in his garden fence. His killer stalked him through a small hole made in the garden fence before firing six shots from a silenced revolver. That area of the garden was the only one not covered by CCTV cameras. It was a violent end to a colourful life. Palmer had been due to appear in court in Tenerife in just a matter of weeks concerning a massive timeshare fraud scandal. He had made many enemies on his way to a £300 million fortune one year ranking him equal to the Queen in the Sunday Times rich list. He had owned properties in England, Spain and France, a £6 million yacht called the Brave Goose of Essex, a private jet and a classic car collection. His life has even been the focus of BBC drama The Gold and a BBC Sounds podcast, Gangster, The Story of John Palmer. Oh, the gold is... So how did... The gold is after him? We're supposed to be watching that on um, Patreon. Didn't even know that. The former roof tiler and market trader rise from poverty on the outskirts of Birmingham to become one of the UK's wealthiest criminals. And why do Essex police believe he was murdered? They did do dirty. You are watching OCG TV. Shout out OCG TV. Chapter one, humble beginnings. John Palmer had very humble beginnings. He grew up in abject poverty, leaving school at 14 to become a roofer alongside his brother Malcolm, engaging in the illicit sale of paraffin to make a few extra quid. Palmer harbored a desire to break free from the hand-to-mouth lifestyle. He had a flair for business he always and had been ambitions trapping. to start his own enterprise. In the late 1960s, Palmer established a jewelry store on North Street in Bedminster, Bristol and achieved a significant milestone by earning his first £100,000 by the age of 20. He Back cruised then. around in a luxury... Back then, that's a lot, too. ...curious gold Jaguar E-Type, and was a prominent... Right now, that's a lot. <laughs> ...figure in Bristol's vibrant party circuit. He met Marnie Ryan at a local nightclub. She worked as a hairdresser and had previously been a beauty queen, and they eventually married in 1975. Palmer established second-hand jewellery stores in Bristol, Bath and Cardiff, and by the early 1980s, he was managing a gold and jewellery business, Scadlin, in South Bristol. The company specialised in buying unwanted jewellery, gold teeth and broken candlesticks. However, it also engaged in the illegal activity of handling stolen goods. This introduced Palmer to some interesting characters. It wasn't a particularly profitable business, in 1982, the company experienced a financial loss, but significant changes were on the horizon. The year was now 1983. Margaret Thatcher secured her re-election, Shergar, the racehorse, was abducted, and the largest robbery at the Whoa. time took Wait a minute. There was a horse abducted? What happened with that? ...place at the Brinksmart storage depot near Heathrow. 
The thieves made off with almost 7,000 gold bars of 99% purity, cash and diamonds amounting to 26 million pounds, or 100 million pounds in today's value. Whilst Palmer didn't take part in the robbery, his connections in the underworld brought him to it, or rather the proceeds. And this was the catalyst that changed everything and capitulated Palmer to the stuff of legend. By now, he was enjoying the good life. He and Marnie had two young daughters and had moved into an 18th century grade two listed building called the Coach House near Bath. Set on 30 acres, it had a swimming pool and stables for Marnie's horses. There was an outbuilding where Palmer kept a smelter, which he used to melt down the stolen gold. He would mix it with copper and sell the disguised bars, leading the press to nickname him Goldfinger. Huh. By January 1985, Scotland Yard was closing in. I heard about this dude. I think we might have did a documentary on him. The robbers and their network. Palmer's friend, Kenneth Noy, who was fencing the gold on behalf of the robbers, had his house raided and 11 gold bars were found. Days later, police so broke into the coach house. They found a gold bar lying on Palmer's sofa and others in the smelter. However, John Palmer wasn't there. He was on a two-week holiday in Tenerife with his yeah. wife and their children. He was in his hotel when the BBC reporter Kate Aidy tracked him down. Palmer granted her an interview in front of dozens of intrigued holidaymakers. Police inquiries showed that his company, Skadlin, had made a loss of £100,000 in 1982. The year after the Brinksmat robbery, it recorded a profit of almost £10 million. Mm. The game was up for Palmer as far as the Metropolitan Police were concerned, but they had a big problem. At that time, Spain had no extradition treaty with the UK. So he was kicking it. It would take a stroke of luck provided by the Spanish government when they changed a local law. Now, nobody was allowed to remain in the country unless they had a valid passport. Palmer returned to Britain to face the music and invested some of his newfound wealth on one of the top criminal lawyers in the country, Henry Milner. It was money well spent. Despite always yeah, good lawyers always money well spent. A lawyer in general is money well spent. Is denying he knew it was stolen gold, the jury believed his claim he was ignorant of the origins of the precious metal, and he walked out of the old Bailey a free man. It was time to return to Tenerife. That's a feasible argument. Man, I didn't know. Shoot, I'm just doing my job. I'm melting down gold and that's it. Chapter two. Fun in the sun. Palmer enjoyed a fantasy lifestyle in the Canary Islands with all the baubles of a Costa del Crime playboy, a Learjet, the six million pound yacht, two helicopters, and his collection of classic cars. His timeshare business seemed to be a spectacular success. Upfront. At the Brinksmat trial, he told the jury he was worth 2.8 million pounds from the holiday resort he set up. By the early 1990s, Palmer had several hundred sales staff at 11 timeshare resorts. In 1994, police began investigating his business affairs, believing initially that the burgeoning timeshare empire might be a cover for a drug money laundering scam. While officers found no concrete evidence of laundering, they did come across complaints from hundreds of disgruntled couples who claimed they had been swindled. How so? Palmer had been operating an aggressive buy-sell scam, which promised to sell holidaymakers a timeshare at an overvalued price within weeks if they agreed to buy another property at one of Palmer's 13 other complexes. Owners were told they could make huge profits, but scores of people were simply left lumbered with two properties. Customers were promised automatic refunds if the sales were not completed after nine months, and Palmer set up several resale companies to process sales. However, the resale operations were nothing more than fraudulent sham companies, taking hundreds of pounds of clients to register for a resale that would never happen. I feel like every time you get into fraud, you're gone. They're gonna get you. Victims had often been lured to presentations with the promise of scratch card prizes, plied with cheap sparkling wine and worn down by aggressive hard sell pitches. 
There were no fixed prices, allowing staff to charge any amount they thought the customer was willing to pay. The salespeople so would claim that a timeshare it. is an appreciating asset offering inflation-proof holidays. Its value often decreases, particularly in poorer quality resorts. It is often difficult to rent out. Every year, maintenance charges of an average £270 per timeshare week are levied on timeshare owners, and these are prone to rise. As an owner, you must always pay these. If you don't, your timeshare may be repossessed. Palmer's cleaning schemes fees? were wildly successful. He reached 105th on the Sunday Times Rich List, equal with the Queen. He learned how to pilot helicopters, bought a French chateau, and started a collection of classic cars, including a rare gullwing Mercedes. He acquired a yacht, the Brave Goose of Essex, and moored it in Santa Cruz Harbour. He stocked his Tenerife pond with rare albino frogs and lived openly with his mistress, Christine Ketley. Hammer's empire relied on a web of shell companies, offshore funds, and... Bro, got too much money when you living with your mistress over your wife. That's insane. And, your, and your, don't forget, your wife is a former miss, a beauty queen or whatever. Tension rackets. And at the web's center was Lebanese mafioso Mohamed Derba, a Lebanese man who was Palmer's former head of security. Derba had some murky connections. He has been accused of laundering up to 500 million pounds in Tenerife for gangs from Britain, Russia, and South America. At the time, it was also alleged that he supplied weapons and money to the Amal and Hezbollah militias in Lebanon and to have been involved in the theft of 1,300 French passports on behalf of Al-Qaeda. For years, Palmer seemed to run things on the island, ruling with an iron fist, but not his own. He created a monopoly on the timeshare market, eliminating the competition. He had a team of heavies who dished out beatings on the order of their ruthless boss. On the business side, he was making a decent move, man. I ain't gonna lie. Let, now, were they most the most morally sound moves? No, but he wasn't operating with morals. And business is very moral-less. Especially when there's competition in business. You gotta... Boss. His Mediterranean muscle were known as clumpers, baseball-wielding enforcers whose uncompromising methods ensured prime pitches on the sun-drenched resort. They clumped the opposition. Rival touts who strayed onto their turf paid a heavy and painful price. In 2001, Palmer earned an eight-year jail sentence after British investigators untangled a fraudulent timeshare network that stretched from dodgy Canary resorts to numbered accounts in countless tax havens. The spate of violence between the rival gangs sparked outrage among the authorities in the Canary Islands and back in England, Palmer, now 55 years old, was finally jailed for his multi-million pound timeshare scams. At 55. And while Palmer cooled his heels in Belmarsh jail, Billy Robinson emerged from his shadows. For most of his career, Billy had worked alongside Palmer, but was now building his own holiday club business, World Global Travel SL, while Flo continued to work in administration for Palmer. The Robinsons had known their cut of the timeshare industry was under threat, and their business rivals were dangerous men. Their luxurious villa in the remote area of Orotianada Alta, near the prestigious Golf del Sur resort, was ringed by steel fences. On the night their charmed lifestyle Red came flag. to a bloody end, Billy and Flo met friends at a restaurant in Playa de las Americas. Florence was discovered bludgeoned to death in her two-seater Mercedes yards from her home. Her husband was found less than a mile away, slumped in the back of his new Porsche Cayenne. His throat had been cut, and he had been shot in the head. In the back? This, this Palmer is... attended their funerals, but Spanish police reportedly suspected him of involvement in the murders of underlings who may have become competitors. No witnesses came forward, and no charges were ever brought. Palmer was eventually released in 2007. He had tried to keep his timeshare business going from his prison cell, but it was never the same. He made returns to Tenerife, but they were infrequent. He had emerged to discover a very different criminal landscape on the Med. Times had changed, and he had lost his place in the hierarchy. 
On one trip, he was collared by Spanish police upon arrival at Tenerife, who clearly hadn't forgotten his menacing period on the island. Palmer spent two long years on remand while evidence was gathered. It was only when he began to suffer from ill health that he was released on bail and returned home to Essex. And that's where it went down, huh? Chapter 3, The Game, the game is, up. is Up. On the eve of his death, Palmer had been warned he faced a 15-year sentence in a Spanish prison after being charged with fraud, firearms and money laundering offences. And that, it is rumoured, was the catalyst for his killing. Underworld associates feared Goldfinger was about to strike a deal with authorities to reduce his sentence. His killer knew exactly which he probably was. Exactly when to strike. The security that had been part and parcel of Palmer's 1980s heyday, when Rottweilers and guards patrolled his Somerset stack, had been stripped long ago. Recovering from a gallbladder operation, slowed by heart problems and haunted by an impending Spanish trial for alleged fraud, Palmer was ripe for the taking. The man who once wore body armour under his bespoke suits had his guard down. Palmer, who planned his nefarious affairs with military precision, had, for the first time, been cold cocked. The killer had cut a hole in the back garden no, fence of Palmer's funny. isolated home in South Weld near Brentwood to spy on him and is thought to have kept watch until Palmer entered the only part of the garden not covered by CCTV. Police believe that Palmer may have seen his killer or killers as they jumped over the fence around 5.30pm and shot him in the arms, chest, stomach and back. Palmer, who was gardening and burning documents, staggered about 20 metres after being shot and was found lying unconscious by his son's girlfriend. The pair were inside the house but did not hear a gunshot, suggesting that a silencer may have been used. According to Essex police, Palmer was shot several times but no one From that heard him hole? die. By the time his body was discovered, the killer was long gone. To the consternation of Palmer's family and the subsequent amazement of just about everyone else in Britain, the police and paramedics who were quickly called to the scene somehow failed to distinguish multiple shotgun wounds from gallbladder surgery scars. How could the police possibly have taken six full days to establish that a known gangster who spent much of his life making dangerous enemies was murdered by a shotgun blast? What were those documents he was burning in his garden? And how had he managed to keep his passport and stay free on bail when he faced so many serious charges and might easily have Be rich. chosen to flee? There was no shortage of speculation that Palmer had fallen victim to the notorious Brinksmat curse, the lethal series of murders and accidents that have befallen at least 20 people, crooks and cops alike, who were connected to the spectacular raid on the security company's Heathrow warehouse in 1983. Then there were his murky timeshare dealings and the thousands of angry victims he swindled out of deposits on bogus yeah, it could have been anybody at that point. holiday schemes. He had plenty of rivals in Spain and elsewhere and may have fallen out with the Russian mob, the Albanian mafia or several of his former employees, one of whom had publicly warned him he was finished in Tenerife. If gangsters are ranked by the number of their enemies, Palmer was Premier League. Whether or not Palmer was really ready to incriminate Premier League Palmer is crazy. Make fellow gangsters or name the policeman he had bribed, there must have been a long list of people who wouldn't want him to talk and who knew where to find a shotgun with a silencer. It wasn't the curse of Brinksmat that finally did for Goldfinger. He just didn't want to go back to jail. Shot, shotgun with a silencer. All right. Tell y'all leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post, man. We gotta watch the gold. I think it's that or gentleman is next on uh, Patreon.